for um, the surveys for the S line. Um, and so that is underway. We expect that to be done in 2023. Um, but that will also establish all the boundaries that will then allow us to complete the transaction for the S line. Uh, yep. Yep. And we're still working with North Carolina on there. They are also um, working with CSX on the section of the S line that's in North Carolina as well. Still a, um, we're, it's still a fair amount of distance in general. Yeah, yeah where, the, where the active track, yeah, ends. I think that's about right. Um, ridership is increasing, um, and we're, which is great. We're starting to see a, actually, um, June 20, June of this year was 24.5% um, higher than May. So we're starting to see an increase in bookings as well. Um, our bookings for in Virginia are down 17% compared to where they were last year, but that's compared to 32% system wide. So um, we are start starting to see again indications that ridership is really increasing. Um, all of our routes um, comparing June 2021 to June 2019 pre pandemic are down um, by about 32%. So um, ridership is coming back, um, and I think we're starting to um, uh, see that. Um, all across Virginia and all, all over, across our routes. Um, in particular, I think it's the, um, actually the Norfolk route that is, um, has, I guess the, or I'm sorry, but no, it's really our um, Roanoke route that has recovered the most, um, but we are still um, system-wide at about, um, I think about 60% of where we are. So. Um, so today we're gonna have a couple other presentations on the transit side. Um, to talk about the TRIP program and our Springfield Quantico study, and we're going to give you an update on where um, we are with the freight program. It is going to be a little bit redundant with what we'll see later in full CTV, but we did want to circle back with you all about the comments that you gave us previously um, on that guidance, too. So um, I'm going to let Jen uh, go ahead and take over to talk about our Springfield to Quantico uh, transit study. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. feels strange and normal to be back um, so this morning, I'm going to give you a briefing on our Springfield to Quantico Enhanced Public Transportation Feasibility Study. It's an award for the longest title. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this will be the first time that you uh, hear about this study at, at the board, but we'll we'll be back with more information as we look around this study up by the end of the calendar year. So just in terms of background, this was a study that was included in the uh, 2020 General Assembly budget. It was a budget amendment that directed us to conduct a feasibility study um, looking at public transportation services basically between the Frank County and Springfield Metro Station all the way down to uh, Quantico, uh, looking at the feasibility of extending the blue line, but also looking at other options including bus rapid transit. Um, the legislation requires that we complete the study by December 1st uh, this year, which we are on track to do. Uh, and we are also want to always emphasize uh, that this has been called the Blue Line Extension Study, but <laughs> the language is very clear uh, that we do need to look at a range of multimodal transit investments as part of the study. Um, in terms of our outcomes, we are uh, working on a comprehensive and an objective evaluation of a range of uh, potential alternatives we are looking at cost benefits and impacts of each of the options uh, that we are looking at really with the intent to inform future recommendations uh, and future investment in the corridor uh, we are looking at feasibility and so it's really the art of the possible and not the art of a specific answer so just trying to manage expectations on that yeah and, sorry to go that, ahead but I, I do just want to read Iterate, um the point that Jen just made. We're not going to be coming out with a recommendation about a mode or a specific technology, um, but really evaluating what's feasible and what um, the potential benefits and impacts are. So, I think that, again, I just want to make sure that that's clear that it won't be resulting in a specific recommendation. In terms of our study area, we're essentially hugging the I 95 corridor. Um, 495 uh, down to the Prince William Stafford County line. 
Uh, just because this is our study area, we are using the regional model, so we are counting for trips that are originating outside of the study area uh, to destinations within the study area, and also those trips that pass through the study area. That's a question we get a lot. Uh, there's also already a lot of multimodal activity in this quarter. We have, uh, obviously, we have VRE and the Fredericksburg line. Uh, we have Fairfax County. It's already working on the Richmond Highway BRT uh, project, which is uh, following the Route 1 corridor there in Shannon and Colorado. So, Jen, just so I'm clear and everybody else is, we've got two metro stations inside the study area. Those yes. are both endpoints for the, the current metro. Yes. So that, that yellow, it's a little confusing because so the yellow line continues to be a, a yellow. This is, Huntington is the terminus of the yellow line. Kern County and Springfield is the terminus of the blue line. And then that's the... the this is the BRT. That's the BRT. It's in development. Yeah, okay. By the county. Thank and then you. you've got the red dotted line. That's BRT. That's BRT. Thank you. So in terms of our technical approach, you've heard me stand in front of the board several times over the last few years, 66, 495, and talk about a technical approach to, this, to you know, looking at different transit alternatives. This study is a little bit different. Um, we have our traditional transit study where we are defining some different alternatives. We're testing and evaluating those in order to come out of the study with those recommendations specific to whether or not different options are feasible. What makes this study unique is that working with um, the partners in the region, with the local governments and elected officials, we're also doing some land use scenarios. And that is not something that those of us that work wow. very much primarily in transportation for our, our careers get to do very often. But it's, <laughs> I have to say it's a little, as a planner, it's exciting because we, we, we always look at those, seem to look at those things uh, separately. And in this case, we get to look at transit separately, but we also get to look at what would happen if we <clears throat> employed some different land use scenarios and how would that affect the feasibility of different transit alternatives? Sure, so, standing up clapping for that right now. So yeah, this, yeah. Like, I've been planning for a long time. I haven't got to do this for a few So this is, this is a good one. So there are two parallel uh, pieces of the study. We actually have uh, two members of our team that are managing those separate but together. Uh, Sarah Williams, who managed the 495 study, is managing the land so use. So all, all future planning initiatives it's going to have this land use component as far as scope? I think what what makes it work in this particular scenario is that we have the partnership of the local governments and the willingness to look at their comp plans and different land use scenarios at the same time we look at, at transportation. We don't always have that um, option, but in this case, it is a real partnership with the, with the jurisdictions. Is, yeah, is everybody cooperating in the spirit of uh, best solutions in that regard? It's been the devil's always in the details. We have a very, it, it's actually, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, no, it isn't. Um, uh, we have a stakeholders group that's met monthly since, since September of last year. And that stakeholders group has you know, county representatives from the, the land use planning side and the transportation side. We have the Department of Defense. We have ERTC, NBTC, and we have all the players, all the players yeah. are coming to the table and are part of those monthly stakeholder conferences. Uh, you know, I think the hardest part is getting people to the table. Sometimes they're not always the right people in terms of the, the decision makers, but at the staff level, we do have that important okay. working together and sharing information and there's, there's buying on the study. We also have, um, for this particular study, we've had to now elected officials briefings where we kind of throw the doors open on the study and it's everybody that's elected from the Fairfax County Board that represents portions of the study area, Sam for Prince William, all of the members of the General Assembly that are elected in that area. We also have congressional representation. There's a lot of interest in this study. And so those briefings are done too. Uh, we're going to do at least one more um, in September and that's kind of those two things have helped look into us working with our consultants to negotiate. Better than hear, better than hear from you. Yeah. And um, on the land use side, as, as Jen mentioned, Prince William County is in the process of updating their comprehensive plan. Um, so this is, from a timing standpoint, a good opportunity for some of this work to help inform mm -hmm. what they're doing as well, because they are looking um, 
very closely on issues of density and things or in development that they haven't necessarily looked at before. It might be worth it for me to just tell my little Arlington story here about um, when the county board was considering bringing the metro line up Wilson Boulevard, which is right through the heart of what was the downtown. They, they um, hired Pete Marwick or somebody like that to, this is 40 years, 45 years ago now, it's 50 years ago, to create three futures, a low density, a mid density, and a high density future. And they looked at square footage and looked at number of residents, they looked at tax impacts. And once they had that, they took it out to the community and one of the reasons the densities are so different along that corridor is that they made, they chose from those futures, different futures for each node. So when I was chair in 2015 of the county board, we went back and looked at what had happened. It was about 40 or 45 years, and it was almost to, to the penny, correct, in terms of the number of wow. residents, in That's terms so of the tax sure. impact, in terms of the square footage. And part of how they chose was about taxes. I mean, that was the big motivator for people was if we're going to bring this and we're going to have these people and this, this commercial activity, what does it mean for my tax bill? And so I hope we're looking at taxes, Jen, as well. I don't know that we're getting to that level of detail in this particular corridor, but we will certainly have the scenarios in there so that the counties can take Yeah, that. because I do think in the end that's how, but but also, if you're talking about bringing metro, it's what's the metro bill here? That is part of the scope. Yes, yes that, is, that is part of the scope. But I do think, as Jen mentioned, I think as Prince William's now in the process of updating their comp plan for the Fairfax, is a little farther along already. But um, you know, this information hopefully will help them be able to run that analysis or be able to look at those different um, types of scenarios. So in terms of study schedule, um, we are moving right along. December 1st will be here before we know it. Uh, so we're in the thick of the alternatives development evaluation phase right now, working towards that final report this month. We have done a lot of outreach. Uh, we've had a, a very robust public engagement um, element of the study. We have websites, uh, project fact sheets, um, all of the information, everything that we've done with the stakeholders is all out on that web page. Um, we did an online survey um, mid-April to mid-May. Uh, seeing a lot of these online surveys for these kinds of studies, and sometimes they do not so great. This one we've got, we received over 1,400 responses, which is pretty robust. Um, so we got some really good input from that online survey. We did have a virtual public meeting uh, back in early May, over 100 attendees made that um, did everything that we could to be as accessible as possible to the community. We had uh, translators available in Spanish and Vietnamese, um, and the, we also had um, everything was closed captioned, everything was very accessible. We had, that meeting had breakout sessions, so we were able to get into some small groups and really have some good discussions with the folks that participated in that meeting. Um, we put this slide deck together about two or three weeks ago, so it's, it's, Future activities is a little out of date. Uh, July 27th, we're having another virtual public meeting, and it's really just, uh, it's an information meeting. So it, since it's been a, a couple months since we've been out to the public, we want to go back out one more time virtually and catch them up with where we are with the study. Uh, then in September, we are planning two um, in-person public meetings, one in Fairfax County, one in Prince William County. Uh, we're looking at the weeks of September 13th, September 20th, so not the week later, but the two weeks after that, um, to, to schedule those meetings. We're working with um, with the counties and also the elected officials in the area to, to avoid any conflicts and, and find locations that work um, to accommodate everybody. So those will get scheduled here shortly and posted. So we've been really happy with the, the public outreach that we've had. And then again, I also already mentioned the stakeholders and, and all of the meetings we've had with technical staff uh, since September. Uh, so we've heard a lot about what is needed in the corridor. We've heard about the quality of transit service um, being being very good and competitive for commute trips, but not so much um, to travel within the study area. We've uh, heard a lot about future development and 
as Jennifer pointed out, Prince William's working on comp plan, so future development is a big topic of discussion, especially in Prince William. Uh, we've heard a lot about equity and the importance of making connections to job opportunities. Uh, we've also heard about connections to activity centers, uh, Fort Belvoir and Quantico, and then Paul, when um, information from the I-95 corridor study has been uh, presented to the board, the biggest bottleneck in the corridor, the Aquaquan Bridge, which is right in the middle of our study area. So uh, we have a, a, a congestion challenge and uh, having the engagement of the Department of Defense in the study has been very helpful because unlocking, getting people in and out of Belfort helps all of this. Uh, travel, con traffic congestion and travel times. I've spent a lot of time on 95 lately. It's <laughs> not fun. Uh, there's a lot of congestion. It is unreliable. And so making those trips uh, it is finding ways to make those trips uh, more uh, reliable and more um, more effective, I guess, uh, would make it better for all of us. And then um, providing access to transit services. Um, right now, the transit services are really, in a lot of ways, limited to people that have a car to get to a parking ride or they have to take a long walk to get to the bus. So um, thinking about our transit dependent riders, um, trying to figure out how to provide good access is, is something else we've heard throughout the study. I'll touch briefly on the land use assessment. Um, which we talked about already a little bit, but we've, we've had our coordination, um, initial coordination with the county planning staff. We've collected uh, data working with them on existing conditions and identified uh, multimodal centers um, and activity centers, which you see on that little map. Really what I'm just trying to show you is there's lots of little bursts of color around these activity centers. Uh, what we're working on now is, is narrowing, uh, narrowing down a list of uh, multimodal centers to, to do some more in-depth planning. Uh, we have scoped to do up to 10 of those locations. Uh, for those 10 locations, we will develop some alternative land use scenarios. Uh, we're going to use a tool called Urban Footprint, which is a state-of-the-art modeling tool uh, that Cambridge Systematics is our consultant on the study. It's, it's bringing it to the table that allows us to model and test not only those land use scenarios, but Just a, an example, this is a, this is the Potomac Mills, Potomac Mills Multimodal District. It's a field area multimodal these days. Um, but these, this kind of gives you an idea of the type of analysis uh, that we're looking at in a district like this, where you've got BRE, um, potential for BRT or Metro extension and what that would look like in terms of a station area or a cluster of stations. Uh, so in terms of our transit modes and what we're looking at with our alternatives, um, I said, said, mentioned earlier that this study is referred to as the first Blue Line Extension Study, but that is not the only thing that we're looking at. We are looking at an extension of the Blue Line, but we're also looking at an extension of the Yellow Line, uh, which follows the same corridor as the uh, Richmond Highway BRT project. We're looking at bus rapid transit. Uh, we are looking at BRE service improvements, but it's very important to note that all of the wonderful improvements that are already going on with the Transforming Rail Virginia Initiative are part of the baseline of the study. Uh -huh. So when you start looking at BRE service improvements, we're talking about incremental addition of service. And so it doesn't look very dramatic because all of the dramatic stuff is part of the baseline. Um, and then we also look at express bus, which we already have very robust. <laughs> So when you lay all those options on a map, it looks a little bit like this. Um, lines are just for feasibility testing. Everybody gets really excited when they see a line on the map. Um, so we're trying to manage expectations. But uh, all of these uh, alternatives are not without their challenges. Uh, if you look at if you look at the blue line. I think we counted it across 95 <laughs> four or five times. Uh, so there are some challenges with these with these. Uh, different alternatives, but uh, they're the ones that we're advancing through testing now to look at you know, ridership, the traction, and then um, the next piece of the study the consultant team's working on is looking at cost and feasibility from a construction perspective. And as science pointed out, we also have to look at the um, implications of another jurisdction and the, um, the Lamont account So what, in conducting the study, what, what's our planning horizon? What's the time frame that we're looking for? So we're, we're looking out to, I'm going to get it wrong on this one, 2045. <coughs> Typical planning horizon of 20 to 25 years. 
we're using the most recent cost model for the so, so from that perspective, DC-95 is, is untouched in this uh, effort. Um, any consideration of perhaps automated bus lanes at some point on 95 is something that will be a, a factor in this quarter in that long time period? I think something will happen, but we can really come back in the next 10 to 12 years. I think hard, there, there's all kinds of things that could happen and that are hard to predict. So we have, we're have we sticking with looking at feasibility of the things that are you know. something that we can predict. Okay. But I agree. I think you will see, you know, continued advances in technology. You know, being on the innovation committee, we dabbled in AV. Sure. It's not as easy as it seems, and so it, it. I think we we need to remain open to all kinds of technology things as they come over the next twenty years. Um. So as this is where you get the intersection of the land use and the transit uh, study. We have been looking to identify preliminary station locations um, to go into the modeling for the, the transit side of the study as well. Uh, looking again at major activity centers, making connections between uh, the BRE existing and planned uh, services in the corridor, existing parking rides, and the local bus routes. Some of these uh, transit centers or locations are already included in some of the small area plans for Williams and the small area plan for, Wood, for the Woodbridge area. Some are already in the regional model, but we are also looking to drop that. You mentioned express bus. This is a, an area of the region that has a significant amount of express bus already, but we are testing some additional express bus alternatives and uh, connections through the corridor as well. So how will we evaluate feasibility? This is all going to sound very familiar because this is much what we do on all of these studies. We're looking at ridership potential, how effective the, the different alternatives are at um, reducing traffic congestion. Uh, we're looking at equity, and there are um, e-trans equity emphasis areas in the corridor as well. Uh, we're looking at regional accessibility and connectivity. Um, there's a lot of folks that travel through this study area from the south and leave going to points north every day. So how do we make those connections beyond um, beyond just this particular study corridor? Um, cost effectiveness will also be something that will need to be considered. And then the development potential, and again, that intersection with the land use study. Um, so that's what we are working on right now. In terms of next steps, uh, again, our next public meeting is July 27th, so it's a week from today. That's a virtual meeting. Uh, we will reconvene the elected officials um, again to do another briefing uh, in early September uh, to go over our alternatives evaluations and the draft uh, draft recommendations. Uh, we are going to have those in-person public meetings uh, in the middle of September. So our our we were originally scheduled to complete the draft report by September. We filled some pushing into our schedule. Uh, obviously, having that, that opportunity for in person public input is really important. So, I think a draft report will probably be more than uh, But we are on track. Uh, we've built that into the schedule to uh, build some additional time in the schedule. So, we will have the final one submitted by the same. Do they have staggered arrival times, departure times, or double? Or is that focused pretty much on a set arrival time for everybody to function effectively? I, I think they're staggered because I don't think you could get them to. As many people that are on on and off that base every day to the gate for yeah. a stamp. And I don't think it changed after 9/11 too, because they moved they moved so many other functions there that they just had to spread it out. Um, it's been interesting talk, talking with Fairfax County. I mean, Belmore is huge, and there's kind of a north node of activity. You'll see it in that in that blue line that looks kind of funny, and it makes this little S curve, but that's really to capture. Um, the north side of Fort Belvoir, and then there's the southern element of Fort Belvoir. Any other comments? So we'll certainly uh, keep you all apprised of this. This is, um, as Jen noted, there's a, you know, we've had a lot of public input, which I think reflects the um, level of interest in, in this topic, um, and certainly a lot of <coughs> interest by our elected officials as well. Um, and so, um, Hopefully, it will help inform some of the decisions that the counties can then carry forward. I think the land use is really critical. It's, it's you know, any sort of um, 
express transit, whether it's rail, express bus, will, you know, really does require some more density and more um, dense activity centers to, to really be as effective as it can be. So um, I think that will be hopefully information that they can carry back and help incorporate into their planning efforts. Great. Have you guys ever looked at the, and this is on my mind today, that's what happens in between, right? You adopt, a, you say, we're going this direction, here's, here's where we're heading, but the land use is very non-intense. There's not a lot of bus service. And your vision is for more intensity and some kind of good transit. That interim period, Things have to happen, otherwise you don't end up in the future you envision. And I just don't know if, if as an agency we have any um, advice or if, you know lessons learned or whatever. I, I it just I don't know, partly because of you know just what is in Arlington. It's it, we developed the Roslyn Boston corridor and Bristol City with Metro. And when we went to look at Columbia Pike and we said, oh, you're going to get more density, people leaped immediately to, we're going to, it's going to be like this. And we're going to have all the amenities that we see over here in this quarter that took four years to develop. So I just, I don't know if, if there's any, I worry about, um, you know, we have a lot of brand new elected officials in, in several of our large communities. Mm -hmm. And think you're going to get it quick and then it just takes it just takes time so there needs to be a coordinated timeline or at least a well at least long. you know it's like in a in a 24 year vision sure. you know it's when like it in the happen. first six years this is what you know they change their comp plan some developers buy in we get some more density that means we could have this kind of bus service mm -hmm. right and then another five or seven years happens and if this is if this gets added, then we can have that. But it's, you know, you can't start out with every six units. And I think some of that is happening in real time right now. I mean, that's that's what we're hearing from jurisdictions and they're seeing some of this, some of some of these developers coming in with these types of very transit supportive plans now. Right. Trying to get so so they definitely have something that the development community wants that their residents want. It's just how fast can they can they move? And I think the the piece of this study and, and Jennifer mentioned that that how much does it cost? I think right. is and is a big start the bus service. Yeah, it's a big piece of this. I mean, they are they have Omni Ride right. that you know operates a lot of commuter bus um, and local bus service in you know, in the area. Um, they they have opportunities to grow. I think it's going to take. A little bit of the county, they're going to have to build what they have. I think there is some of that illusion of how fast something like this can happen. Yeah, and I guess that's what I see here is this is an agency that can provide both a reality check and a possible path that says, you know, here's kind of what we would expect in the first five, seven years if this is the density that gets built. Just the, to help people manage expectations. So that would be a new role for the RPT that you just described. Uh, I suppose that's true. And, and I think a very important one. So you bring up a really good point is that, you know, you turn this over, everybody goes, mm -hmm. and, and every entity within that governmental may deal with it a bit differently. But it would seem that the RPT could play a role at least providing, as you've just described, having an Arlington, an expectation of how things will progress over the 24 year period. I mean, I think there's lessons in Fairfax with Mosaic and with some of the other work. It's not just Arlington, but but it just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, and I know that's one thing we've heard a lot from Fairfax as well too. To, to in in because they are somewhat farther along, they and they also have the experience of Dulles Corridor and Tyson and um, yeah, and the um, but the level the changes in density that similarly have taken 40 years to um, to transpire. And so I think um, yeah, that's one thing we've always heard. we've heard in some of the meetings that um, you know Fairfax is saying that this is. Saying to Prince William, this is, you know, this takes a while. And this doesn't, you know, you have to make a lot of decisions and commit to it early. To, right, and um, and you, I think part of the Arlington experience for, for that as well is 
consistency of purpose on the board, regardless of who's sitting in the seats, makes a huge difference in whether you can achieve the vision or not. I would think because these facilities are linked between jurisdictions, that if you play, if you played that role, looking at the long-term coordination, it would help make sure that there's consistency between the planning processes, so that Prince William doesn't get ahead of what's happening upstream or vice versa. So. Yeah, Route 1 BRT is a good example. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that, that is an example where we did um, the, the early feasibility analysis mm -hmm. and um, and then kind of handed it over to the county and said, you guys take it from here, and they have. And, right. and now they've taken it to, you know, towards the implementation phase um, and, and making you know, the land use um, changes as well. Um, that now has been six years um, since that was finished, five years. It's been a while. It's, it's been longer than that. Yeah, it's yeah. been a sad thing that started when I was still on the island. Yeah. Um, um, but, and of course, you had Jeff McKay, who gets it as the supervisor in that district before he became the chairman of yeah. the board. So, so anyway, I just, um, I have a lot of respect for these people who, who are trying to do the jurisdictional work. I really do. I also think it's sometimes very hard to have a longer perspective, um, and it's necessary. So. How many MTOs are involved in this area? How many MTOs? Really just one. And <coughs> and VTA and, and, and TPV and that cost. Is it active? Oh, yeah, both of them. Oh, very. <laughs> <laughs> This is the very sort of southern end of that right. planning, um, planning area. We have also had some folks who have studied from the Fredericksburg um, area metropolitan planning organization. They are not within the study area, but we are. But the people leave there and come through the study area. So, so obviously they're very interested in it. We brief them and we talk to their staff quite a bit um, to say, look, we can understand we've got to understand your Certainly, very keenly interested in that. the next jurisdiction. And how many planning districts? One. Which includes which counties? Fairfax, Prince William, Loudon, Arlington, and then Alexandria. So it's, it's, it's planning big. District. It's planning Geography. District. Yeah. Population. Yeah, yeah. But I will say, you know, Loudon doesn't pay a whole lot of attention <laughs> to what's going on for us. What's going on over they have their own challenges over on the but we've, we've briefed with um, the Potomac Rapid County Transportation Commission, which is, operates on the ride, hunting piece for that gas tax. They're in Prince William and South. And then we've also briefed the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, which is basically the one of the compact jurisdictions. I would say they're not as interested. Um, it, it's on the far, it's on the edge. And so it, it is, it's really a Fairfax County yeah, I mean, I think if it were to come to fruition, the and conversation the about thing. voting seats and all kinds of other things would rear their ugly heads. And, yes. and as Jen mentioned, we, one of the things that we'll be looking at is, you know, if any um, expansion of Metro would require Prince William County to join in on the compact, which brings with it a lot of financial implications as well, financial, political, um, I think the governance. Something that's built to come. So it would require a change to the amount of compact. Um, and also changes in uh, the um, General Assembly of Maryland and DC Council. So, anyway, it's, there's a lot of, um, but that is something that this study will kind of walk through as here's all the other sort of institutional governance things that need to happen. And here's what the funding implications could be um, if perception is central. But not unlike what happened with the um, at Loudoun County um, with, with the Dulles extension. Okay. Um, 
so Mike Todd is going to talk with us now. And if we presented the freight program um, to you all earlier, and we um, got some comments from you, which um, we'll talk about how we have incorporated that. Yeah, I was wondering instead of running for the presentation again, since you'll You'll see it in the workshop. I figured I'd just use maybe a little bit of a cheat sheet of the comments we got and talk about the changes. So, um, first thing that we heard was um, keeping track of our rail infrastructure <clears throat> and so that we can see the progress of this program and other programs in the RPT. And so that actually is. Um, being developed, actually, it's, it's been developed as part of the rail plan effort. Um, it has yet to go live, but it will be incorporated on our um, rail uh, database that's on the DRPT website. <clears throat> and we're going to take it one step further um, and actually inventory which sidings, industrial leads, crossovers, all those types of infrastructure um, also use state supported funds. So not only can we see the total inventory across the state, but we'll be able to see which ones are supported as well. That, that's great. What's the expected online? Um, I, I think it's within the timeline of, this, of the rail plan. Um, so uh, within the year and a half, I think the rail plan's on an 18 month timeline. Uh, second, uh, state goals, um, you know, aligning uh, with state goals as an eligibility requirement, no issue whatsoever, added that as an eligibility requirement, and then it also remains in the scoring element as well, so we kind of have double duty there, which I think is actually appropriate because the secretary during the, um, during, uh, the you know, the, the prep meeting, she mentioned that, um, you know, kind of alignment with state goals and coordinating with OIB and the, the uh, Freight Advisory Committee and things like that was Kind of one of her most important issues to connect this program to the rest of the state planning efforts. So um, I think that's great. Um, safety was mentioned as um, something that we should include in the scoring element. Um, it's included in the benefit cost analysis model in two different ways, um, both for the uh, reduction of crashes that occurs as uh, a mode shift to rail. Uh, rail has less incidents as, um, as trucks on the road. Um, and then also, we get, uh, you know, credit in the BCA for uh, closing crossings. I'm sorry, I had to take a second for that one. Hard. Um, and so uh, hopefully that incorporates safety well uh, within the BCA and, and, and the scoring element. Uh, we also had some discussion about the potential applicants and their team. Sure. So that, that's basically the highway safety, the safety issues that we're talking about, the roadway safety, based on the offset that we put, put in. Right. Any consideration of this of, of improvements to safety corridors where we're, we're going to be um, increasing the use of those corridors for passenger rail? Yes. So that's actually the way the model is set up. Is you can um, you can kind of expand and contract it as needed. So you can have very spot specific, but then you can also um, do corridor wide or even statewide. And so we have those measures for and kind of all of those geographies. So we built into that. So yeah. <laughs> Um, the, just, there was some discussion about potential applicants and how this might uh, impact other programs that, that um, current applicants use and it seemed like there was maybe some confusion. So uh, I added a slide to the presentation. I think it's slide five or six. It's kind of in that background introduction portion that just outlines all of the previous programs that you're managed and then what's happening to them so that people just get a better understanding of you know, the interaction between the existing and the future and, and, and all that. Um, and then uh, state match is also discussed as um, allowing other fund, other state funding sources, such as smart scale, for example, um, uh, so that we can supplement these projects with other funding sources around the state. And so essentially, I just removed that from the non-eligible items. Um, I probably won't really harp on it explicitly because the rest of the audience won't really know that's changed, but I just want to highlight it for you here since I mentioned it last time. In a generic sense, who are the potential applicants? So um, it, it's, it's kind of anybody, but really you have to be coordinated with the rail owners and operators. So a locality could be an applicant, but they must coordinate with a rail owner and operator. So really this is, a, as a rail infrastructure fund, we're talking our short lines, class one railroads, uh, and so forth. So it's primarily railroads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
at other, you know, uh, it could be a locality, it could be a regional, uh, an MPO, but they would have to be coordinating with the railroad because it would be a railroad infrastructure improvement. Or the port. Or, yeah, exactly. Would, would the two major railroads be potential applicants? <laughs> Yes, as well as all of our short lines. Right, yeah. And how do you sort out uh, the private and your consideration of a, <coughs> that one of the two major railroads getting state funding for uh, infrastructure needs that generally have been a part of their own capital budget? Well, it's not unlike what we do today with a rail enhancement fund um, projects where um, an NS or CSX could apply, and they have applied in the past for projects that had capacity and were able to demonstrate that they are taking trucks off the road, and um, which is really the measure and also the um, sort of what, what establishes the legality as well of, of being able to utilize state funds for, for those projects. So, this is, again, we, it's, um, the size of this program is such that I don't think we'll see. Yeah, there's not a lot of money here. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think we'll see ourselves funding, you know, a lot of 20, 30 million dollar projects out of this. So that just, you know, doesn't exist. But I think as well, um, there's a lot of capacity that we're addressing on both networks through some of the Transforming Rail in Virginia projects that um, both the Western Rail Initiative and also the, um, uh, CSX initiative as well that, that is adding a lot of capacity to free benefits as well as passenger benefits. So I'm not sure we'll see a lot coming from the class one railroads in the next 10 years. I'm just guessing um, out of this. My program. impression is they have excess capacity. I think it depends on the corridor. There are some, I think, that, you know, some more than others. And following on that comment, and back to the real inventory. So, Mary's often commented on simple metrics. We can look at and understand where we stand in the context where we move it forward, we move it backwards, and staying steady. <laughs> We've got a year and a half to do this plan. It would be so helpful to have a um, graphic representation followed up by the data to support it that would show us major corridors, yeah. real corridors. That would identify current ton miles and passenger miles on those corridors, and that would then identify the capacity of those corridors as well. So we we really don't know how much additional capacity we have in any of these corridors to take maybe large um, segments of trucks off the road. And to the point of this conversation that these are relatively small dollars, it may be very wise for us at some point in the future to look at an underutilized freight corridor and make a major investment with a private carrier if they guarantee a substantial reduction in the truck traffic on those roads. So the mechanisms for that are all available. Um, obviously, most freight railroads are cautious with their presentation of information on ton miles and things of that nature. But I think through various mechanisms, including remote sensing applications we have now with the satellites, um, we could cobble together a fairly accurate picture. We could use annual reports. Sometimes CSX and NS actually show the ton miles on their respective routes. I think present a very helpful picture to this board and future boards to say, maybe we do want to make a substantial investment to race point. Maybe this line is at 20% capacity and we could take you know, 800 to 1,000 trucks off the road per day rather than adding new lanes on 81 or 95 of them. So as we look at planning tools, that would be an extraordinarily helpful tool to have. And it takes the guesswork out. So keep in mind that in the 1960s, railroads took their own decision to reduce the capacity by eliminating the double track all along the Gulf of Southern Corridor from Alexandria, Atlanta, and the Gulf of Southern Corridor from Fort Hook um, on toward West Virginia. Those were all double track lines all the way through from the 1960s. They decided they could save money by going to a combination double track and single track. That greatly reduced capacity that troubles us to this day on the 
on uh, performance of our bachelor's programs. It would be good to get a baseline too, before we the return to Longbridge of what's happening there and then what's the possibility once we actually can move the passenger over to the new, the new track. Having baselines for all of our rail industries would be so helpful for my views. That 10 mile thing, or whatever you suggested, I would have been in 10 miles. I see the used to publish those. I I, still I, doing I, some of the railroads used to publish exactly what they made their routes were. But even without that, you can probably get a picture of what they did there. And then I think perhaps the program could change and adapt to significant strategic opportunities that we don't even know about today. I mean, I keep coming back to we need to be strategic. We need to be strategic with the government's money as we opposed to still being only responsive to what they ask about. That would be yeah. No, that's a great suggestion. We do have that. Data. Yeah, so actually, um, but for the previous rail plan, we purchased some train search data um, that goes off the way bill information. Um, and we had a bunch of, you know, tonnage uh, by corridor information, purchased that data again for this rail plan in coordination with Wavy. Um, and so they are actually doing for, for the roadway network, we'll be doing for the rail network, we can compare and contrast, and we can also see trends from the last time. See opportunities. That's, you know, we're going to have some jumps out of us. We've been looking at the 81 quarter for years for alternatives to get trucks off that roadway. You know, maybe there's some things that can come along this way. Yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. That's all I had. And, uh, unless there are other questions or concerns about the, any of the edits that we made. Well, thanks for doing it. So, so how much money do you have annually to allocate? I think that it's on the uh, page. Uh, it's maybe three or four. Yeah, the table here. Yeah. So it's that bottom line? Yeah, so it's modest about it. Yeah. 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 Great. So um, our Final presentation is Jen's in the back to talk about uh, the trip <laughs> the trip policy. Yes. There's no presentation. Um, so back in May, we're all okay. on the mic. Oh, no panic. Back in May, we did a briefing on the draft trip policy. Um, we did that while we had the document out for public comment and the um, yeah, our public comment period ended just before the GMCT. We got uh, six comment letters uh, by the deadline. Three of them were, and one of them was just, you're doing a great job, and we like this. Um, one that listed off some very specific projects for the Richmond region, which was also nice. We shared that here. Um, we had uh, a letter that we received, um, interest rate from your region, worried about competitiveness of the program, particularly for regional routes in a smaller jurisdiction. We, talk to the folks at the MPO out there, Vernon, and let them know that the legislation takes care of them, that the way the program is structured, uh, we make sure that everybody's going to get their fair share on a five-year roll on the average. Yeah. That left us, oh, I'm sorry, and, and the, the question that came was specific um, to the use of congestion as a scoring uh, tool for these types of projects, not unlike smart scale, um, but unlike smart scale, we don't, there's not a statewide bucket where regions are competing against each other. Instead, in, in, in the um, Roanoke New River Valley area, the, um, they will just be, they would be selecting among projects amongst themselves. So that shouldn't be a concern. Yeah, so we, we have talked to them. Uh, that left us with three letters that gave us some rather, um, I would say substantive co uh, comments about the policy and the guidance. They were really good. Um, they were the kind of comments that we needed to take a little bit more time to dig into. So we, we delayed coming back to you last month. We've got uh, a policy that we'll bring to you tomorrow for approval. Um, in parallel, working on the CTV policy, we've also been working on a guidance document. So some of the comments we've put into the CTV policy and some of them we've addressed in the application guidance, which was also out for public comment at the same time. So we, we had a lot out there for public comment and a lot to update to make sure that we were consistent. Um, some of the 
just I want to hit on some of the, the key changes. We heard from um, folks on both the regional rounds and the zero fair that they wanted us to be able to provide funding for a longer period of time. That's not an uncommon comment. Um, and that's something that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, but we have we do have limited funding. And the idea with this pro program is to kind of cycle these pilots through, uh, bring down the state share over time, and then they either continue or they, or they don't based on their success. We did add language to the policy for both sides of the program that says, and this is very similar to what was in the um, interstate operations and enhancement program, um, that we could potentially extend eligibility beyond the pilot period based on the availability of funds and projects. So that gives us some flexibility, particularly in regions where they might not have a whole lot of these projects, but they have funding that's dedicated for the region, they have the ability to. And I, and I think, especially in regions where we really just have one operator, and and so for like Richmond, Lynchburg, or Lynchburg, yeah, they've got one project that meets criteria in their strategic plan. So there may be, if that, if that's the region's priority, to continue to have sort of have that. But I think in areas like such as Northern Virginia, where you're going to have num numerous transit operators with interest in the program and a single Northern Virginia pot of funds. You know, we do need to cycle these demos through so that it will, it will free up um, funds for other jurisdictions um, to tap into. So a couple other changes on regional routes. Uh, there was, we've got four different project types of regional routes. And some are very easy to quantify and to score. And then we had regional subsidy models, which we didn't address in the policy. But you can't really score those through the methodology. So we did go back and clarify how we would look at those. And we look at those based on regional input regional collaboration and a regional request. Um, and we also removed, there was some language we put in to say that we wouldn't accept applications for bus only lanes in fiscal year 22, just because there's not a, not a whole lot of money in fiscal year 22 for regional routes. We took that out thinking that there may be some, we, we did want to limit, so we did also take that out. On the zero fare side, I would say we made the more significant changes. We uh, got comments from a couple of commenters about our scoring methodology on the zero fare side. We had weighted uh, the scoring element for increased ridership as the highest element of the scoring uh, methodology. And then we had um, a lesser percentage of the score based on applicant commitment and implications on accessibility and equity. And what we heard was, I know this is a transit ridership bar um, incentive program, but <laughs> The zero fare really has a lot to do with equity and accessibility. So what we did is we went, went back and we changed that scoring methodology and we leveled it all out. So all three of those elements will be 30% of the um, calculated score because ridership does still need to be a component, but they're even. Um, and the remaining 10% of the score is going to be awarded based on project readiness. So that was that was a comment we received across all three of those letters. So very, very consistent and something that was easy for us um, to modify. Another comment on the result of a change in the policy on the zero fare side is uh, we heard from GRTC here in Richmond and also from Alexandria that they had already committed to be zero fare in fiscal year 22. So their budget. Uh, they're using money, either local money in the case of Alexandria, um, GRTC is using federal COVID relief funding to stay zero fare and they're like, we've already made a commitment wow. and now you're you know, come in and, and how do we do that with this funding model that starts high with the state and then it's uh, leveled down. So we added a statement that said, that gave us some additional flexibility for those systems that had already committed in fiscal 22 to remain zero fare for the full calendar year to allow them to have some flexibility in how they apply so that they can then take this year and then but they're really looking at the next four years. But, but they're expecting to do this in perpetuity. They are about, wow. Their intent is to do it in perpetuity. The, the magic is how do you fund it in perpetuity? I don't understand that, but I, I think zero fare is actually the secret weapon that lures people into service. I mean, it's got such potential, especially on the equity issues. Uh -huh. it's so much better. We don't, I don't think we talk about it enough, actually. Yeah, and without too much about what what JRTC is doing. They're doing they're, they're working behind the scenes, really trying to build community support for zero fare in the longer term. 
um, but they're using their their COVID relief funding to get to go for another year. So they you know, they've made a big commitment and they've taken a leap of faith. Now they need other people to partner with them to stay that way. That's a remarkable bit of positive news in my view. Yes. I mean, the things we've learned that that is a that again that's a shot heard around the region. Right. That, 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 it, it's really exciting, actually, for for Richmond if they have potential to stay right like, there. Yeah. And um, I mean, what we've seen is, you know, they did not have the same loss of ridership that um, they had that we saw around the state um, because they were they've been able to stay um, uh, fare free, and it was so critical during COVID to shorten essential trips. And so I think um, I'm excited about it. I think they're they are doing all the right things in building up support in the region. Um, they also do have regional funding um, mm -hmm. available here now as well. So I think um, they're, they're looking at building partnerships with the private sector, um, other, pu other public sector um, as well, VCU, um, they've got a partnership with them. So it's, they're, they're doing a lot of great things to stay. It would be fun, actually. It, it, is. it would be great, actually, at some point to sort of hear from both jurisdictions what, yeah. the, what the components are. You know that the metric there in Northern Virginia is that the on Metro people, the rider pays 80% and the region pays 20. It's reversed on bus. So the region is paying 80% and the riders paying 20. So in that, right, that is it? No, the, I, the reason I was, <laughs> I think that is actually flipped on its head a little bit through COVID. Oh, it's the one issue that we've. Yeah. But, but it's, it, um, but the, you know, the cost of not having to maintain machinery, the cost of not having to deal with money collection, all of those things kind of go into reducing what the real cost of going for free is for you. And Josh Baker from Alexandria gave a great um, presentation at MBTC two weeks ago, I think at this point, I can't remember, um, but um, about that. And Timmy talked a lot about the cost of fare collection yeah. and the cost just of um, a, a single fare box. It's, it was it's huge. It's huge. Because because collected amounts. Yes. Yeah. And it's all technology. It's technology <laughs> driven. And there's been some work done here in Richmond because initially some of the discussion was just having the city of Richmond stay zero fare. And it actually would cost more to do that than to just make it. Yes. So, yeah. so that's yeah. yeah. an education. I really would be curious to have them come and talk at one. That's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Good. Yeah. 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 A future meeting. Um, and just one last comment, because we are our, 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 our coordinating agenda. So when we consider what COVID has done for our commuting habits, and I think that for a period of time anyway, conversely, found a way to eliminate peak traffic. In, in the toolbox of options to do that on a long-term basis, maybe definitely zero fare is just a great redeployed strategically, and I'd say relatively inexpensively in consideration of reducing peak traffic. I think it's, I mean, I, I'd love to see all trains wow. be free, to be honest. So I think it's, I think it makes a lot of sense. Or, well, I wouldn't say all, because I think there's certain, application. there's certain high value services that are, you know, commuter based services that rail that I think, you know, are, you know, maybe a list. To, to, yeah. 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 But I also think um, what we're seeing, and you all saw this in the presentation we received last month about traffic, especially in Northern Virginia, I'm referring, yeah. and how much it has. Um, I mean, we're back at, Pre-COVID levels. Um, I, can I can attest to that. But, <laughs> I, yeah, as you all can see. but I think that's been at the expense of transit ridership. And oh, I think yeah. that it's, you know, I think yeah. that will start to change as after Labor Day, as people start to come back to work more. But I think that having, and, that, and that's what places like GRTC and DASH are seeing, that they have all these opportunities now to maintain that fare-free service, to capture that ridership back, or, or to maintain that ridership. Um, at this such critical time. So it is a great opportunity. So just just to share, you know, there's been some research on zero fare before COVID, but COVID changed the zero fare game completely. Um, our team wrote a research proposal to the Transportation Research Board that was selected for funding. And so it will be, that, that project will get up and going and, and Lauren Fishbein, who um, manages the trip program for us, and I'm kind of nominated for to be the lead on that study with TRB. Um, so we're trying to like figure out now that COVID happened, Bold. what does zero fare look like? Be because bold. it's not the same as it was before. Yeah. So with we're this, trying to lead the charge. This is modification of behavior that comes with very definable dollars. And, and, and by the way, this is happening all over the country. Right. It's not just here. There's, there's, you know, we're seeing a lot in Minnesota, you know, in North 
Pacific Northwest, California, there's a lot. A lot of systems um, are in St. Louis, is that another? Uh, uh, Kansas is City. Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think what makes us unique is that the state is leading the charge of putting money behind mm -hmm. and that. And then I felt to hear that out of my community as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Based on the based on the feedback we received, we also made some changes to the application guidance, which goes into a, a layer of detail that's much more specific to what's in the CTB policy. But some of the things I think were notable. One one of the comments we received was the importance of getting rider feedback on our regional routes projects. And so we have a quarterly assessment. We want to manage the effectiveness of these projects really closely. And so there's a quarterly reporting and quarterly engagement um, for pilot projects in this program and we've incorporated rider feedback that's you know, what, what the riders are seeing and the services that are being provided. Um, we also made some changes um, to some of the evaluation criteria just to provide some additional flexibility. Fairfax County operates a very large system. You know, like how, you know, how can you evaluate us compared to maybe a, a smaller system uh, that you know percentage-wise one route makes a big change where it may not make as big of a change in Fairfax and also for Fairfax County uh, we have a requirement that a route from the regional routes program cross jurisdictional boundaries. And Fairfax <laughs> County reminded us that they're very large and that they're major activities. In terms of, you know, rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> but then, okay, so we have modified that as well. Uh, and then uh, we, we provided some additional um, flexibility on the analysis side for the zero care program as well, as well as providing some examples of what that analysis would look like. Um, I, I think folks always like for us to tell them a little bit more about what they're looking for. Uh, we did have um, we did have a couple of comments uh, that we didn't uh, didn't incorporate or we didn't address uh, the extension of the longer term funding availability. We did not um, incorporate that. And the other comment we did incorporate was to provide funding out of the trip program to provide studies to develop projects for the trip program. And while that's important, we have other mechanisms to do that. Uh, we really have limited resources in the trip program, and we want to make them. We want to put them to their highest and best use. And so we think we can take care of the planning elsewhere and uh, use this funding for implementation and for things that people can see and help get them to make these uh, So that's on the agenda for tomorrow. I will not go into the details. Very, very exciting. It is very exciting. Yeah, and we'll we'll. This is something I want to keep bringing back to you all as we're getting applications in and. and Talking about what we're seeing and, and how to um, prioritize mm -hmm. these things. It's, it's, um, I'm excited. I think this is a great opportunity to move the ball forward. Yeah, I should all quickly discuss this point that plan efforts down North Virginia. All very exciting. Timeline We're ready to go with the trip. We're really ready to go. Um, so we're going to have a webinar on the 28th. Somewhere in there. <laughs> We've got so many things that are going up for August 1st. We're going to open our application cycle for growth on, I think it's August 2nd. Um, so that would be the Monday. And it'll be open for about six weeks. Uh, so we should be able to come back to you at the subcommittee in September and kind of give you an idea of what happens in terms of applications. We will not have had a chance to answer that point to do any analysis, but we can at least tell you what we, what we got. And then our hope is to come back um, to the full board with a presentation on the program in October and then action at the next meeting after that. So, so they, they can start in yes, be mid year 22. Yes, it would be a mid year grant. Um, that cycle. So it's out of cycle, and it, but, but, but because these projects are going to be multi year, we're going to look at making multi year recommendations. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. We're going to ask for 29. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have like four up on the same week, so I'm losing track of which one's coming. But this, this is really exciting. Great. Yep. So we'll continue to keep you updated um, also on the state rail plan. I mentioned before, this is something, it's an ongoing effort over the next 18 months, but this is something we really have a lot of input and feedback from you all on. Um, we have some other legislative studies that are underway right now um, that we'll also um, share the results with you, one of which is looking at extensions to um, Bristol, and also we have the Commonwealth Corridor, which is being looked at as part of our state rail, rail plan as well. So that's the, that's the east-west yeah, possible. Yeah. Again, more of a long range planning. So, so. Just a quick question on that. So, is the underutilized Clinchfield rail network plan the East West discussion at all? Um, I don't think specific, but it's, yeah. No, I'm 
bench. Yeah, yeah the port is far west. Right there, right? Yeah. yeah, but it is ultimate. Those we look at, you know, it's part of the Commonwealth, and that's probably the first three abandoned routes in the coming years. Yeah, like abandoned it once, and then, then it's pretty right. Right. It's it's right. It, it'll go for pennies on a dollar from the standpoint of a contiguous right of way. And it's a conversation that we've had question the distinction between rails and trails and the rail bank, and I think it's very important. But at the strategic acquisition, if for no other reason than for recreational opportunities, but preserve it as a future corridor, would be something that we should get our, our, our game plan. Yeah. Okay. So it'll, it'll, somebody's going to look at the balance sheet at some point, nix that, and then it'll be on the market gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, I'll talk to the team and see what's going on. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much. Meeting adjourned. Gentlemen.